Friday. Good day, Dad. Today is today is Wednesday, right? Wednesday. Yeah, it is. is. Okay. Today's yeah. Wednesday, May 29th. Um, and uh, we can start. You were just talking to me before we started the show that there uh, about some developments with uh, Ukraine striking radar installations um, in Russia, and I heard a little bit about that as well. Um, I, I, and so maybe you can start. <laughs> by telling us a little bit about that and the gravity of that, those attacks, and then we can move into uh, Rafa and the Middle East. Um, okay. So, the floor is yours. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, one at least one radar installation. Uh, I believe it's a, it, it's in a, a in an old blast, an area that's just on the other side of the Kerch Bridge from Crimea. And to give you an idea of where it is on the map, you know, just to the uh, to the east of, of Crimea in the mainland Russia, um, approximately 800 kilometers from Odessa. Uh, okay, it's a radar installation. What's special about it is it's a Vor they call it a Voronezh radar, and this is not this is a radar that is used to uh, spot ICBMs at a great distance. In other words, it's a, a street a strategic um, anti you know ICBM radar installation. It's the sort of thing that the, it's what the, the, the Russians use to detect an incoming nuclear attack from the U.S. Um, it's not what's it's not used at all, you know, for um, uh, for the conflict in Ukraine or would have very limited utility for the conflict in Ukraine. It's a strategic um, installation, you know, again, for uh, <laughs> to, to detect an ICBM. Yeah incoming ICBMs. Uh, this was this one installation was struck, um, I think it was on May 23rd, by a drone. And, uh, you know, later examination of the record showed it to be a Portuguese drone that was supplied to Ukraine, um, I think it was last year or possibly even earlier. Um, it was funded by the British and manufactured by the Portuguese. In fact, it was just it's a, a maritime surveillance drone as really for civilian use. But the um, the Ukrainians modified it, you know, uh, attached an explosive explosive device, and turned it into a kamikaze drone. Um, there was possibly a second attack on another Voronezh radar facility much deeper into Russia, um, actually in the um, very close to the, the Kazakh border, uh, close to the town of Orsk. And this is a, you know, a great distance from, um, uh, from Ukraine, actually well beyond the, the flight range of this drone. So if, if indeed this occurred. Now, you know, the funny thing, we had some reports about that a few days ago, but then the most recent reports haven't um, have mentioned the initial attack, but then haven't mentioned the second one. So I'm not quite sure if this attack even occurred. The initial reports about the second attack on the second installation uh, say that the facility itself was not hit, um, but that the yeah, the drone was um, was intercepted some some distance from the facility. Um, but, you know, this is, okay, this is not a minor incident. These are, you know, this in fact is the, the first known attack of uh, a strategic nuclear defense installation, you know, in, in Russia or anywhere in the world. You know, this is something if that actually, according to Russia's own uh, nuclear doctrine, this could justify the launching of nuclear missiles on their part. Now, um, now, I, I don't think that was ever considered at this point, you know, because this was, again, it was a small drone. It apparently, it did superficial damage. Um, it probably won't take too long to repair. And it appears to have come from Ukraine, you know, not from a nuclear power, you know. But if, if the Russians had believed that this attack had been had come from the United States, that could have justified actually a nuclear response. I mean, this is how, again, how serious this incident is. Um, so, you know, what happened? This is really, this is extraordinary. Why was this done? Who was behind it? Um, was there, you know, NATO involvement, U.S. involvement? Um, if so, you know, that, that raises, a, you know, really should bring a lot of alarm bells. That, it, that would be a huge escalation. It's an escalation in any case. 
Uh, so there are different theories that are floating around. You know, some um, some argue that it um, that yeah that that the U.S. was involved, and this was some sort of warning that the U.S. was giving to the the, the Russians. You know, when the Russians said that they were going to conduct this uh, ta tactical nuclear drill, you know, which uh, you know I think they're um, they actually have, they have already carried out, according to my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was saying, okay, yeah, well, we're not scared. You know, look what we can do. I don't think that's true, but I've, I've that's been put out there actually by some military experts. If, but, and others say that well, the U.S. had to be. In, you know, how can we explain it otherwise? Because you know, this was at a great distance, and the only way that the um, that the Ukrainians could have gotten this drone there is with, you know, coordinates and um, um, flight path data provided by NATO, you know, in particular by the U.S. They would use, need NATO satellites, you know, to to chart a, a path for this this uh, drone to its target. Now, in the case, if they're, if they're indeed the second facility, which is deep in in Russia, you know, in the um, close to Orsk, uh, c close to the border with Kazakhstan, uh, that you know clearly could not have been launched from Ukraine. Um, it would have to have been launched somewhere within the ter territory of Russia or Central Asia, one or the other. And that's possible. Actually, you can go to the website of this the manufacturer. Something again is it's for civilian use. You know, it's something that I think like a Coast Guard or whatever uh, from different countries might purchase. Um, it's got about an 11 foot wingspan it's about six feet long uh it weighs like 60 70 pounds you know it, it, you transport it in a box it's made like a chest it's maybe six feet by two or three feet um it's not something that you could you know uh, somebody could carry out into a field i think it would take two guys to carry it and to transport it any distance you'd have to put it in the back of a van it seems to me, you know, it's not impossible that this was launched within the territory of Russia, but it would be challenging. I mean, it would be, wouldn't be easy to get it across the border and smuggle it into Russia and, and do this. Um, so it, now, you know, my own feeling, oh, okay, one other theory that's out there is that this was actually, um, um, the, that the Israelis were behind it. This is a serious theory because this, Apparently, this um, this facility you know, faces south and can detect mis mis missiles that are launched from Iran or Israel. It's something like, for example, the Russians. You know, the relations between Russia and Israel have deteriorated remarkably over the last several months, <clears throat> and you know the, the 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 Russians or rather the Israelis see the Russians as close allies to the Iranians and likely to provide them with you know useful radar data and maybe they were trying to hit it again actually I don't believe any of these theories none of them really make sense to me and all of them just seem again you know it was, it was kind of an amateurish attempt it was this civilian drone that was modified and really didn't do very much damage and really couldn't have done very much damage and eh, you know whatever you think of the israelis it just seems like they would do something more lethal or whatever they'd have something a little bit more professional but who knows okay not, nothing's impossible my own feeling is that it's just the ukrainians and that it's it's another stunt by budanov who is the um you know the head mm -hmm. of military and intelligence the GUR I mean the, the guy is nuts and the thing is a lot of the stuff he does just doesn't make sense it just they just seem to be kind of wild escalations just you know the attempts to just kind of get something started and you know create conflict or raise the temperature or just strike out of the Russians in any way you know these assassinations these attacks on civilian targets they don't make any sense, just like we're talking about yesterday. And so it, to me, this has the trademarks of a Badan of Ukrainian operation. I mean, again, it's a civilian drone that's been modified, the kind of things that the, that the Ukrainians do quite often. You know, it doesn't look like a professional NATO operation. And yeah, you know, maybe it was difficult, but it's not impossible for them, I think, you know, without special flight data. They can get lucky and get a drone through. And, you know, again, a couple... Apparently, just today, two more drones were sent to the same uh, facility in, um, in um, Amavir, I guess is the, the town that's nearby. 
but they were shot down before they got there. But this one, you know, you can always get lucky. And this one got through and did a little bit of damage. I mean, it just shows the the recklessness, I think, of the Ukrainians. And it might explain to some extent why, um, well, uh, the the Americans and some other countries are, are saying are, are walking away from the, you know, the all the escalatory talk about uh, making strikes deep into Russia. They're just a reminder of how crazy the Ukrainians are. But the U.S. hasn't walked away. Well, the U.S. has, is- actually. No, the U.S. has actually quite explicitly. There were mm-hmm. actually three different statements made by um, um, spokes people for different U.S. departments today. I think for the State Department, the Pentagon, and let's say like the Security Council. Um, and each of them said basically the same thing. No, this is something we do, we do not approve of. You know, we're, we're not giving permission to do this. So it sounds like there was a collective decision within the U.S. government not to do this. And I think that's encouraging. You know, clearly there was an effort like Blinken himself, which I think is kind of bizarre. The Secretary of State shouldn't be leading a charge on something like this. He's supposed to represent policy rather than make policy, right? I mean, that's my understanding. But, he, you know, he was pushing for it. But, and I wouldn't be surprised if Biden was very sympathetic with it. But I think maybe it's just saner voices in the Pentagon said, no, this is crazy. You know, this is like the Russians really will respond to this and it will be ugly. So let's ha- not do this. Has there been a, this uh, understanding. So has there been a, a, a direct statement from the administration here in the United States condemning these attacks uh, on these radar systems? Have we, okay, have we well, been speaking out? Right. Well, right. That's actually very interesting. There just there has been just complete silence, and I think that silence is very telling. It's just it's sort of strange how certain things get played up in the media, and then other things, huge things, you know, that are sometimes are just just are are not spoken of at all. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I there's think another. That, well, I was just saying, yeah, that reminds. There's another example, just like one. Uh, David Cameron was saying that okay, right. we need to strike into Russia using our weapons. That was just kind of. Nobody talked about it. It was just okay. Well, at first, they, yeah, he talked about it, but it was what they didn't talk about is when, oh. okay, the Russians came back really hard, right, called right. in the That's ambassador, right. you know, gave him a you know stern warnings, and then that just got almost zero coverage in the press in Britain, even though it was a big story. And I think you know, like then, like now, that happens. Okay, when, um, okay, you know, like the government makes a decision, maybe actually to back down maybe to actually comply with an adversary's, you know, demand. They don't want to advertise that fact. They don't want to be shown as weak. So they said, let's just not talk about this. But, you know, quietly they say, okay, yeah, we're going to do this. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think that's what happened. And yeah, in well, both cases. Was was there a statement from, um, from Russia saying, you know, any type of retaliation, retaliatory remarks that they would, that they made? Well, it's interesting. The Russians didn't talk about, I mean, the, the, it's, you know, it's well known, but the Russians, there was no official statement from the Russians about the attack on this facility. But um, today, Putin actually just made it crystal clear, just talking about in general, he said, like any attack with an attackums or a storm shadow or a, let's say a Taurus, if they're ever introduced into Ukraine, will be regarded, you know, just he made this very explicit, will be we will understand that to be an attack by a NATO power on us because we know that you have to, you know, that these are not weapon systems that the Ukrainians can operate by themselves. Uh, they, you know, they do not have the ability to do it. They need the, you know, they need the coordinates. They need the data. They need to know how to operate these systems. And and it's your experts that are doing this. So if it happens, he just said, we will know who did it and we will respond. I mean, he just, he made it, this, he made a statement from, Uzbekistan, where he's, you know, he's paying a state visit. Um, it was, you know, it was, he didn't beat around the bush. And it's, again, it's kind of like, it's gotten, here's another thing, you know, again, it got almost no attention. You know, this, this was a big statement of saying, yeah, we're going to respond, you know, including with strikes on your territories. You know, we're not going to limit ourselves to assets within Ukraine. You know, it could be where it doesn't matter. If you're going to strike into our territory, we can strike into, and we know the Poles are behind it, we can strike into Poland. If we know the the Germans are behind it, we can strike into Germany. I mean, you know, that's, he didn't use those exact words, but that was the the clear, you know, uh, implication of what he was saying. 
So this these were this was a very, very stern direct warning that he gave. He got no play. And again, I think it's the same reason. It's just sort of like when it gets you know, when it's real serious and and you know the, the the collective decision within the Western establishment is said, hey, yeah, maybe we should cool the temperature a bit. The way they respond is just by by not talking about it. Rather than well, saying, oh, he gave this warning, we better be careful now. Because I don't think they want to ever show respect to Putin. Hmm. I mean, this is what they're kind of been their policy all, all along. Like earlier, he, you know, he would say things that that weren't, weren't warnings of these kinds, but they would twist their words and say, oh, look, Putin the madman is threatening to use nuclear weapons or whatever. But it was they didn't. They knew it wasn't a real threat, but it was just, you know, it was just part of the narrative. But when it became real, I mean, I think you see um, a, a very different response. And I, I think just in general, that ought to be encouraging. That you know, I think what we were talking about. There is this, there are these very reckless elements on the Western side, but there there is still some sanity. And it seems like when they get right to the like at the edge of the precipice, or edge of the abyss. There's this tendency to okay, say, okay, let's let's hey, this is real. Let's step back, and we hope that that it's just one of these days those cooler heads might not prevail because there are obviously these hot heads and these very, you know, these uh, very uh, reckless people like well Macron or in this case it was um, Anthony Blinken mm. who've been pushing hard for it, and then there are always the the poles and the the, the Baltic states. Okay, well, maybe there's another way to look at it as well, though. You know, the silence you, you're saying is just a recognition of them backing down and saying, we're going to just sort of push this on the rug. We don't want to look weak. But it can also yeah. maybe be looked at another way in terms of if uh, if we do go ahead and, and use our attackums to strike into Russia and then Russia retaliates, then the U.S., the West could say, like, this was unprovoked. You know, they're, now Russia's attacking us <laughs> because we didn't play it up, because we don't talk about this warning that Putin gave. Putin said, look, we know uh -huh. what you're doing. If you use these weapons, we know they're coming from you under your guidance, under your instruction, using your, your satellites, all, all, all this. Um, and so we're, we have the right to respond. As if, if the U.S. in Western media stays radio silent on that and doesn't tell their their population, the public that, hey, you know, we can't do this because there's a retaliation, then, you know, obviously when it, if it happens, they'll be like, well, yeah, Putin told you not to do it. So why did you do it? But if yeah. we just stay silent right. on it, just like the whole invasion, you know, of Ukraine uh, in 2022, in the, in the beginning, uh -huh. the, the, the whole thing was unprovoked. We don't talk about the Maidan revolution. We don't talk right, about right. the shelling of the people in Donetsk City. Well, you know that for eight, eight years, we yeah. just that's right. all right. silent and it now it's just like blue. look right. it just came out of the blue so could that also be the same position well, okay well okay yeah that's oh. the, i think there's some truth to that it's certainly it's in a way it is a sign of weakness of the cooler heads you know that they're not really challenging the narrative as you're saying they're kind of leaving the the narrative of just crazy putin and we're all powerful in place they don't want to challenge that so um it it does give strength to the hotheads, you know, if, yeah, and these issues always come back, right? You know, they come back, mm -hmm. there'll be another battle, another tuck of war. And it, you're right, it does give them the advantage in that case. Um, I think, you know, in this case, well, it's because, okay, there's a silence, but also there are the explicit statements by, um, you know, in particular by the U.S. government. You know, it may not just, not just but one department, by three, you know, three departments, all saying the same thing. I think it. I, I think we can believe that for the time being. Okay, yeah, they they do not want to go down this road. I mean, I mean, well, I hope so. But yeah, you know, it, we we can see it could just be a minor deescalatory sort yeah, of bump, right? And right. It it's, it's, like, it's just sort of like um, the same thing with, you know, Iran and Israel. There there are these people that have been just have been lusting for war against Iran for years and years and years, and you know, within the U.S. government. And they, you know, and they they're not gone, and they're going to look for another chance. And you you know that Netanyahu still is looking to give them a chance. So you know you just know it's going to come up again, and we're going to have another tug of war. And we just hope that the saner people prevail. But there's just no guarantee of that. You're right. Okay, before we move to Rafa, maybe we can just talk really quickly about the peace summit, just kind of segueing because 
the, this whole these attacks that you're seeing if they're coming just from Ukraine and Budan, if they just sort of reek of desperation, and the fact that uh, Biden and the White, the and Blinken, the State Department are walking back some of their statements about uh, striking into Russia using U.S. weaponry, um, kind of could lend to the you know push for the 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 narrative, the story that the U.S. might try to walk away and distance itself from the Ukraine project and pivot towards the Middle East or, or, or Asia. Um, and one thing that I heard that can lead lend to that story as well is that um, uh, Biden himself is not going to be attending the peace summit in uh, Switzerland. So this yeah. big touted peace summit that seemed to be, be, you know, I saw this video, it seemed to be produced by the CIA, Zelensky talking about, you know, how we're going to yeah, have yeah, peace. Yeah, no, I saw the and, video. <laughs> Right. And, and right. I also looked up, uh, you know, just Google that I wanted to know what countries are in attendance. And I try to find it in MSNBC and a few others that over 80 countries attending over 90 countries. And then I was kept on asking, looking, can I have a list of the countries? You know, I was talking right. to co-pilot, finding it. The only yeah. countries I can see is nowhere near 80 or 90. It's like 15 European countries, Canada, Australia, Japan, and like two African yeah. countries. Probably um, some South Pacific islands as well. <laughs> maybe I didn't even see those listed. But but yeah. the fact is that Biden, and the U.S. It's, itself is not attending these talks. Yeah. And the, he's the reason sending he, a delegation, but he's yeah. yeah but I, Biden I guess himself you himself is not going. He was right, expected okay. to be there, and he's not going. Right. It's supposed to lend the weight. Like this is the and and right. the reason he gave to not go is because he has a donor dinner to attend. <laughs> He has a fundraising <laughs> event. So it's like, yeah. does that show to show the priority for Biden? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think it does. That Like, he knows he's in a battle for his survival, right, to get reelected. It's looking grim. And I think, like, his advisors are telling him that Ukraine is not a, a winning issue. It's not a vote getter. It's probably only a vote loser, you know, even on the Democrat side. It's just there are not many people that are going to vote for you because you're sending money to Ukraine. And, and, well, isn't uh, you know, this nobody... just a huge kick in the nuts for Ukraine. You know, Zelensky's yeah. thinking, well, I you know. Mean, you're right. It should be a wake-up call. I mean, one of many wake-up calls that he's received over the last, you know, year or so. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, well, I've heard it's, you know, it's not just in the U.S. where uh, Ukraine is not getting a whole lot of play, you know, in the, in the, uh, um, in the upcoming, well, in the kind of in the, the run-up to the election. It's also in uh, Great Britain, you know, and their their election is actually just about a little over a month away. It's going to be held on July 4th. Um, uh, the conservatives called a snap election. And from what I hear is that there nobody's talking about Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is incredible, you know, because, you know, they've, of course, you know, everybody knows that the British are just up to their eyeballs in Ukraine and are making all kinds of incendiary comments and, you know, and it basically handed over, you know, all their um, their military hardware, you know, you know, whatever tanks could still function, you know, they, they're they left with, with you know, with just a bunch of, uh, of junk now. Um, and yeah, you you know you, again. There's clearly a lot of people among the within the Pentagon and just in the political class there in general that are are passionately devoted to the the Ukraine project. But now that the election's coming, they're not talking about it because they know that people do not share their passion. I think it's true in both the U.S. and in Britain, and probably through most European countries as well. This is an, a, an elite obsession. It's not a, a, an obsession that really extends to any large segment of the of the uh, the populations. Yeah, I think eventually Zelensky's going to realize that he's being as he's toxic. The, the Ukraine situation is toxic. There's no way to win to look good. Um, so it, it could, it, you know, I, this is what I've always been saying from the you know months ago was just saying that Ukraine will turn on the West. I still think that's going to happen. I can just see it. You know, as it, this country is just really decimated, could. yeah. Um, it, we will see. Um, yeah, it'll be very interesting. Um, yeah, there are signs of that. There, there are mutterings. Let's say, mm -hmm. and yeah, and I, there's just it's just again, it's just like I think we were talking about last time. It's just that the like the opposition to conscription is is really at um, couldn't be more extreme at this point. Mm -hmm. you know, there's. Um, yeah, and so you know, that just shows you again that the gap between the the people and the the elite has is turned into a yawning abyss in in mm -hmm. Ukraine, and that just does not spell well for you know the regime there. It's I, I don't think it can last a whole lot longer. Right. 
Okay, well, maybe we should try to uh, let's let's pivot over to to Rafa, um, so we don't sure. get bogged down in Ukraine for too long. Um, so I, I think we could, we can just start with the, this this bombing of the uh, tent city, basically uh, out in western Rafa, which happened two days ago, and I think the whole world or much of the world has seen this right. horrific footage, especially this image of, of a man holding a headless child, a child that had his. Yeah, yeah had just clean blown off burnt off um and the man's you know screaming um just absolutely heart-wrenching um right. and what i thought was kind of interesting is that israel immediately after this attack said oh this was a mistake um right. and actually, we'll, no, they, they th that wasn't their first response okay okay i was gonna but, actually yeah, ask they because, said, because, yeah go, right. go, go on go on yeah i think actually the first that you know they said oh no this was you know a precision strike uh you know on on uh hamas leaders that we identified in this area and so and then you know and then um uh, okay there was some sort of other comment but then they then later when it became when they the, these uh different opinion leaders and and political leaders expressed their horror at what had happened um uh, uh Netanyahu realized he had a real problem on his hand. He said, oh, it looks like this was a tragic mistake. But it was only after the response that he came, he said that. Okay. Because I was about to say, because before, usually Israel never says that. They always say, you know, they've been going, they've been bombing cities and killing civilians and, you know, talking about the right to self-defense the whole time doing this. The only time I heard him right. really issue an apology was when they killed, you know, American and European aid workers or Australian aid right. workers, the, the, the world central kitchen, world central kitchen workers. Right. Yeah, um, and right. now, and so this is a time where they just bombed the camp and then they saw it. But I, right. I, I think that's just like you're saying, it's purely because eyes were on Rafa. Everybody saw the images um, and the footage right. afterwards. And right. then, so right. they just had to walk. There are a lot of people who have generally been strong supporters of Israel, you know, who said, this is too much. You know, this, mm. this, this has to stop. Right. One example was uh, Piers Morgan. I was, that, that's right. what I was going to bring up, right. yes. Right, he's very much, you know, he's been a Zionist, a very much an establishment figure in the media for, you know, forever. Uh, but to his credit, I mean, he's, and, and maybe this explains, uh, you know, he, why he made the statement or it partially explains it. Um, he's had people like John Mearsheimer and, uh, and uh, Finkelstein, on his show and he's debated mm -hmm. with them. He's always taken the Zionist side, but he actually has had him on. And that's something that the right. others won't do. And Even maybe people like Jackson like, Hinkle. <laughs> you know, yeah. So I maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some of the things that, well, first of all, it maybe shows that there is a little bit of openness and he's, he might even feel like he's got to hide it, but, you know, but he kind of brings in the other side and pretending to, you know, to, to say, well, you know, we'll have, you know, of course, you know, just for, for debate's sake, we'll bring him in, but we all know what's true or something. Um, but he's had him, and yeah, he expressed his horror, you know, on a, without qualification at, at what happened. You know, what makes it particularly horrible, I mean, there there are always horrors of war, but this was, you know, first of all, these people have been sent to Rafa. They were told that that was a safe place. And then, okay, okay, now we're going to attack Rafa. Well, you can go to this part of Rafa and you'll be safe. And it's a tense city, and then they get hit there. And you know, say what can you do? Forty five there... people killed, right? And and they said they killed two Hamas militants, but everybody knows that Hamas is underground, two hundred yeah. feet underground or so. So right. the, the, when when they're bombing these, are they ever? How do they justify who they killed? Did they yeah. release names? Well, or, you know, well, how do they say? How do we know? Yeah. I mean, do yeah, you think they killed know. it? I probably not, or and maybe again, it's their lavender program. You know, but like, even you, then, it's like okay. It. Yeah, yeah but they're we making. Know, we're saying that we, we explained how that casts a very wide net, and a lot of people that are Hamas associated or whatever. It's just like half the population is of Gaza, right? So you you it killed doesn't mean you, that they're militants. Even if you were bragging, like, yeah, we got them. we got these two militants. Well, it's like okay, right. well, there's 25 dead children now, and 20 right. dead, you know, right. men yeah, and that's women, and not justified. It can right. never be justified. And in that, these are just people that died. The amount of children right. and and uh, women and people I've just seen with you know lost limbs and you know and just horrible right. conditions. So right. for every person yeah, that well, died, I think we're talking we about no three idea. or four people. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, one thing is like, you know, we it may not be for years or uh, maybe never will we understand the, the um, you know, the total 
uh, death toll, you know, from this conflict. Because in in just about every war, actually, most of the deaths are not a uh, result of direct fire from the enemy. It's it's a lot of the indirect causes, you know, disease and um, malnutrition and, you know, exposure to the elements, you know, and, and you can see all these things happening in, in, in Gaza. And the only way to figure it out is, you know, it was done actually in Iraq um, after the Iraq war, after the Iraq invasion, different studies were done. There's one that was, you know, just a, a study of, of direct uh, casualties, you know, people killed by bombs and bullets. And it came out to be something like 100,000, which is a, you know, it's a horrific total. But then there was a very careful study done by, I think it was, you know, it was one of these leading medical journals, like the Lancet or the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and just using a very well-established procedure. It's not like they came up with some sort of innovative way of counting excess deaths. But, you you know, you look at the records, of, you know, in this part of the world, you know, what is, what's the usual mortality you know, every year you expect a certain people, number of people that die from old age, disease, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, and then, but I, typically um, during a war and immediately after a war, you see a real spike of um, you know, excess mortality. And they found that they, they were able to attribute at least 700,000 deaths to the war, 700,000 to a million. My goodness. Um, yeah, so I mean, like we may be, you know, maybe we don't even know. It's, again, you know, there have to be excess deaths. You know, when something like ninety percent of the the, the uh, you know medical care facilities capacity has been totally destroyed, and people are you know are are it, at best they're intense, and quite often you know they're just out in the open, and um, you know without access to clean water, with just either you know with very um, um, very little to eat, you know, suffering from malnutrition, you know that there has to be a huge increase in deaths. And a lot of those are not going to be recorded now as, you know, uh, deaths from the, you know, the Israeli attacks. They're not going to be um, attributed to Israel or to the IDF. But but in fact, you know, you, you have to include them. They are casualties of war. And it's mm -hmm. going to be a lot higher than, you know, those that are actually were directly killed by bombs and bullets. Right. Uh, how, how do you think Israel will proceed from this? You know, I, I feel like this situation has changed a little bit. You know, people like Piers Morgan, you said, are beginning right. to turn. Fervent Zionists are beginning to be like, this has gone too far. There's this whole campaign of all eyes on Rafa. Everybody right. watch what's happening. And Israel, I'm right. sure, is like, ew, don't watch what we're doing here. You know, don't look at us because we want to yeah. be able to just get But now they can't because everybody is said like this is the last remaining city you told people to go here they don't have anything and you're just yeah. you can't just bomb them even though they obviously yeah. are and but they did right. and then they said oh that was a tragic mistake so right. do you think well, that i think i understand i think another actually they they hit a, another tent city today and i don't know how many but dozens of casualties that was the last so you think that they, they're not going to slow down? They they'll just send, send you know do well, the normal game of yeah. lip service of like oh we'll investigate our yeah. own war crimes. Um, yeah. Well, it sure seems like I mean again within Israel, you know maybe something will shift. You can you know I can't say that it, it can't shift, but within Israel the pressure still is on Netanyahu to do more and not to to let up. Hmm. I mean, that's that's where, you know, I, I think that's his own inclination, you know, though he's a, he understands it's important to keep, um, it, well, to, to at least to maintain the support of the United States. He probably doesn't care about the rest of the world. I mean, he would just as soon have Western Europe supporting him, but if he's going to lose them to hell with them, as long as he's got the 800 pound gorilla, he's OK. Um, and, you know, so far he does, you know, just look at the statements that both Biden and and. Uh, Trump are making about Israel. They're just trying to kind of outdo each other with their their love for for Israel and the IDF. Can I ask you an impossible question? Can okay. You, <laughs> okay. So can you just try in like three or three to five minutes or so, just play out this Israel-Gaza conflict to its logical conclusion? Can you just walk? We keep on talking about what's happening yeah. and what we think. Can you just, yeah. I know it's impossible because there's so many unknowns, but just Right. Just try. See, see what, let your brain do its thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I'll just, I'll, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I, uh, but okay, I'll just, I'll think of just one possibility is that I, I think there's no doubt that, that, um, that the Israeli government wanted from the start of this, this operation, um, to ethnically cleanse Gaza, to actually just drive and or kill, you know, all the Palestinians in Gaza. And I think they know they can't kill them all, but they'll kill enough to, you know, to frighten them, you know, off into the desert, into Egypt. And um, I think there's, you know, Egypt has made it clear that, oh, we're not having any of this. Uh, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to, I think that the idea is, well, we'll set up a temporary, you know, uh, refugee city just on the other side of the the border. And, and uh, you know, when the conflict is over, they can go back. And I think the Egyptians say, you know, what's going on? You know, they know what happened in 1948. You know, those those Palestinians were never able to come back. And they say this is going to be, you know, they're now all in Jordan or in Lebanon or in neighboring countries. And, and some of them ended up in Egypt. But this time they would all be in Egypt, two million Palestinians or the million and a half survive or whatever in Egypt, and it would be Egypt's problem. Um, so they're, they've held firm, but maybe, you know, what, what we're seeing right now is uh, um, fighting taking place right there at the Egyptian Gaza border. There's a, okay, there's a Rafa crossing, which has been closed down. Um, and there's something called the Philadelphia. Philadelphia, yeah. Yeah, Philadelphia corridor which is just a strip of land. It's actually, it's Egyptian. Okay. There's no, it's not like this, this belongs to Israel or is jointly managed or, you know, belongs to Israel and Egypt jointly. It's, it's Egyptian territory, but there was a, an agreement that was reached at the time that Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2003 say, okay, well, the, the Egyptians, you can get, you can move up there and um, you can control that territory uh, but your job is, okay, we only are going to allow so many soldiers, I think 750, and uh, so much of different kinds of equipment. You know, you can't have an offensive force there. It's just going to be, you're going to just do patrols to keep the Gazans from sneaking in and out. And, you know, that was the agreement in the Philadelphia Corridor. Um, but now what I understand is actually that you know, this is, a you know, it's an agreement that's held since, again, 2003, over 20 years. Um, and as part of maybe the larger peace treaty that was made between Israel and Egypt in 1979, a very important peace treaty, you know, it was the first peace treaty between Israel and one of its, you know, Arab neighbors. Um, and huh, it kind of explains the subordinate position of the Egyptian government to Israel and to the U.S. That's why, you know, they pretty much do their bidding. That's the deal is you listen to us, and we'll give you some billions of dollars every year. And, um, but we don't have to get into all that right now. Uh, the thing is that, you know, they've had this, this peace treaty and this understanding about the Philadelphia corridor and Israel is now breaking it because they are sending, from what I understand, they are now, you know, entering Egyptian territory, which is the Phil Philadelphia corridor. Um, you know, recently there was some sort of exchange of fire and at least one Egyptian officer was killed. Um, now, I don't know how serious these incursions are, but this could be very serious. And, it, you know, it could, there are different ways this could go. It could go, you know, uh, the, again, as we've said many times, the Egyptian government is solidly allied to the U.S. and is trying to avoid war, any kind of conflict with Israel at all costs. But the people feel otherwise. You know, they're outraged. They see their brothers being, you know, massacred just on the other side of this border. Um, you know, they, there could be a revolution. There could be just for its own survival. The Egyptian government realizes, hey, we can't continue like this. We've got to put up some kind of fight. Or the Israelis may just, you know, um, decide to drive well beyond the Philadelphia corridor and, you know, create a space to drive the Palestinian refugees there. Now, nobody's talking about that, but I, I think that's been on their minds. That's what they've wanted to do from the beginning, and maybe they'll go for it. You know, maybe this is they they see this as the only solution, and they'll you know they'll make some excuse about, oh you know the Egyptians shot at us, you know, and the Egyptians have been facilitating you know passage, uh, 
uh, you know, smuggling between Egypt and Gaza. And in, indeed, that kind of smuggling goes on. You know that, you know, we we simply have to take this territory to make this place safe. You know, that's the logic. And then and maybe they'll, they'll extend farther and attempt to drive all the Gazans and Rafa in, you know, onto the other side of the border. That's OK. That's just this kind of one wild outcome that I could see. But I think it's and, uh, you know, no, that that's not, I, th yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that too. You know, I was just reading about that um, right before we started the podcast that there was a little skirmish and an Egyptian was killed on the at the Philadelphia Christ crossing. Um, and like yeah. you said, from what I understand is that Israel is going to take control, is trying to is, is take control of this crossing, which is the border between Egypt and Gaza. Um, right. The and crossing so that, is supposed to be kind of supposed to be jointly managed, I think, by Israel, the Rafa crossing by mm -hmm. Israel and Egypt. Um, but yeah, the, the corridor is supposed, is supposed to be just Egyptians. And I think, I think you're right. Maybe like the Israelis are taking complete control of the crossing and are, are actually penetrating into the corridor too. So do you think that they're going to like knock down some walls in the corridor and then try to herd the remaining Gazans in Rafa into, uh, uh, into Egypt? Is that, is that the plan? I, I mean, I know possible. that's what they're. There was yeah. a lot of talk about in the beginning. It was like, oh, you know, like, oh, these Arab nations are not taking in the refugees, you know, and well, yeah, they just need right. to go. I, I actually read that in the New York Times, like the poor Israelis, you know, they're not getting cooperation from the Egyptians. Mm. I said, well, of course they're not, because everybody knows what they're trying to do. <laughs> you know, mm. <laughs> don't play naive. Um, yeah, I think it's what they want to do. And so it could be they may make a, a move where, you know, they're hesitant to do it. But they're again, they're kind of st stuck between a a rock and a hard place, you know, what's the alternative? Are they just going to go on? You know, they're going to, there's going to be incident after incident. They're going to continue to pay the price. They may say, <laughs> okay, this may look bad, but we'll get it over with. And then it'll be Egypt's pro problem and we can start, and then Gaza will be ours and we can start bu building our beachfront property. But if they um, do that, you know, Egypt is going to, is going to strike back, right? If, if you say, because this is an invasion into Egypt now, if you're taking yeah, over yeah. Egyptian territory right. to to right. put it, to flood your country with uh, right. you know refugees, um, so that well, that's the, the danger. It Israel can is have, right, that right. It's the danger. I mean, uh, Egypt has been, you know, has been a real just vassal of the United States, but it, but I think that yeah, again. It, you know, there are limits to what this even this vassal will be willing to to subject itself to. And even if the vassal state, like we're talking about Sisi and his government, if they do go along with it, they just may, you know, find a, you know, uh, there may be a coup or a revolution in the country. I think it just may, you know, it's just too much for. Right. Um, yeah. Because they're watching what's happening every day. The population is I'm yeah. sure, you know, if, if we, if people in America and Europe are paying close right. attention, imagine how close attention right. the population right. in, Much in closer, Egypt. Right. And, and, right. and I know not they've even done th things like, for ex like there were uh, relief efforts. For ex I remember seeing like, especially in the early months of the conflict, there was just these human convoys because they're, I, there's these restrictions on the number of trucks that can go up, you know, that, that the Egyptian government places and the Israelis do, how many can go through the crossing. People were just carrying food on the, you know, on their backs just to, to deliver to the Gazans. The Egyptians were Egyptian commoners. Right. And, and I think, you know, think about the, the 750 soldiers on that border. They're watching the slaughter yeah. in real time. I mean, because that's, yeah, they're, they're right. less than a mile away from Rafa, right? I mean, right. well, what I understand right what happened to that. Okay, and that exchange of fire that led to the death of the Egyptian officer, what I understand is that he saw like Egypt, uh, Israeli soldiers chasing down and killing some Palestinians right across the border. And he fired. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the story is that, well, you get different stories, where, you know, maybe they cross the line or whatever. But I, I could see that like maybe he just lost, lost it. You know, it's like, okay, I'm not supposed to do this, but my brothers are being killed right across the border. I, I and he fired, and and that's what led to his death. Okay. Well, you you played out, uh, I think, a very short term scenario that I think I agree makes sense. I mean, it's clearly what Israel wants to do is they want to, you know, get evacuate everybody out of Gaza. If they can't 
push right. them out, you know, kill them or or to make yeah, them flee to Egypt, they, whatever's right. easiest. I mean, they, even they understand they can't kill all two million of them. That just would be, that would look really, really bad, you know, it's, but they, but I, I think the hope is you kill enough of them, you destroy all the facilities, there's nothing for them, you know, to, no way to support life there and you drive them across the border. Hmm. Okay. I, I think that's I, the plan and they just may, you know, and, uh, and I think the U.S. knows that's the plan because, in fact, in the early months of the war, that's what um, Blinken was doing. He was going and you know, he was presenting this plan mm-hmm. to CC and to other Arab leaders. And they were telling, telling him, go to hell. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I heard happened. Um, right. But that's clearly, you know, they, they, that was the initial intention. I don't think there's really any doubt and that the U.S. was actually on board with it. And now, you know, they, I think they went back to Israel. Ah, yeah, they're not going along with this. But the Israelis are probably going to say, well, hell, you'll, you'll find a way to make them go along. We're going to send them across the border. Just that, again, we don't know what will happen, but I, mm-hmm. I certainly think there are people in Israel that want to do that. And that intention is they, that intention was there at the highest levels. And I don't think it's gone. And, they, and what alternative do they have? Yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I, that's that's my prediction analysis as well. I mean, I think it's been kind of clear from the beginning, actually, that that's the goal. But, but I, I'm not 100 percent satisfied with your logical conclusion. I, I want, I'm talking about the conclusion, you know, with that ends with Israel. Do they take? Do they end up getting all the land, or does Israel dissolve? Because I feel like ultimately, if we play this out to its eventual yeah. conclusion, yeah, that's those not are the, the only conclusion. Right. right, right. But the, these these are the two – these are the only two possible outcomes. If we play this out to the end, it could take, you know, 10, 20, 100 years. But it's, to me, it seems clear that either Israel has to be dissolved as a state or all the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank are going to have to, you know, leave the land or, or be killed. Yeah. You know, th- those are the That's two, the, two ethnically outcomes. Ethnically cleansed one way Ethnically or cleansed, yeah. right. So right. – so, where do you see it going? Which one do you think? And can you do a quick? I know it's hard, but are you able to? Be, I mean, that's everybody wants yeah. to jump to to like, hey, how does this end? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right, right. Well, I, I again, it's just kind of uh, when I look at it, I just see, you know, just you know, a, a landscape, a, a smoking wreckage of death and destruction. Destruction. Meaning, I just it just seems like it's it's going to end in a a wider war, and um, yeah, it may end with a total destruction of Israel. Um, well, I, it could be the actually the yeah. third option is the destruction of the whole land where it's almost uninhabitable. If it goes nuclear, yeah. and then right. all of a sudden, you know, it's the the Samson yeah. option. You I just said, don't, right? Yeah, pushing right. down the temple Again, walls. Again, it's just so. like when you get to that stage, just like. Who knows? I mean, just really. Okay. But I, I won't I, I really want it. I'm just kind of going just a step ahead, saying, okay, I th- I think it's there's a real possibility. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but there's a real possibility. There's clearly a, the intention, okay, to just drive them across the border to Egypt, and we may be just may be seeing the beginnings of that, and then, but that could provoke a real serious reaction in Egypt and the other Arab states, and it could that could spark a wider war, and then who knows, and then all hell. You know, it's all, in a way, all hell is already bro- broken loose, but it'll just continue to spread. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I feel like Israel's becoming increasingly reckless and, you know, they have seem to have no real regard for the opinion uh, that the world holds of them. Yeah. No, now. no I think that's clear. Um, I mean, they, like these, the ICJ um, um, order, you know, was met with was followed by this attack on the tent city you know mm-hmm. I, and that may have been the that may have been the purpose actually of this attack which is to say it was a big f you you know uh it was a big middle finger to the icj and to the world the, community speaking of, of the icj and the icc I, i'm sure you heard this too that the head of uh Mossad or former head of Mossad, i believe his name is yossi cohen yeah um has uh, he has threatened the ICC prosecutor who's opening up an investigation in Israeli war crimes? Threatened right. the, the 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 prosecutor's family get recordings right. of her husband and blackmailing him, right. saying like, "Hey, if you want you and your family to stay safe, you got to play ball with us." Um, right. Yeah. This and, was actually the, the it was a former ICC prosecutor, a, a Gambian woman, and uh, yeah, no, she came out and said that very directly. He threatened me. He threatened my family. Right. And this is was in The Guardian. So it's it's just the 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 I feel like, 
you, like you said, the mask has fallen off and they're becoming right. more and more reckless and people are more and more people are kind of coming forward and be like, yeah, we've had enough. We're not playing these games yeah. anymore. Right. Uh, we're not going to be bullied or intimidated, you know? Yeah. Um, right. Right. And, and that tactic has worked, seemed to work very well, but all of a sudden once right. the it's tide interesting, has turned. Like she, yeah. It's interesting. She didn't talk about it earlier, but I think it's just that they, they went too far. There are just too many people. Yeah, who have had similar experiences. Finally, you know, that's the problem if you're a bully. You, you know, if you start bullying too many people, you end up, you know, creating a whole army against you. And I think maybe that's what's happening here. Right. I mean, there's very few. I feel like there's not that many friends left um, for Israel yeah. other than yeah. the politicians here in the U.S. and the U.K. But yeah. that, that I, I don't know how much longer that will last. Um, so yeah. Well, it's still I, the, it's very, you know, it's still... You know, the political support, again, yeah, we've talked about it. In the short term, it's still really solid here in the U.S., but the mm. long term is questionable. If you could tell anything to Israelis living there now in Israel, what would you yeah. tell them? Like, is, to, I mean, did that they should they, they need to leave or, or go home or yeah. that this is going well, to A lot of them badly. left, you know, that was right. Yeah, this is, um, you know, just wake up. I say, just look. Um Okay, maybe you don't have any, any concern for the life of a Palestinian or, you know, of any Gentile for that matter. But if you're concerned about Israel, if you're concerned about your future, you, you simply, you are not going to survive as a nation if you continue down this road. You know, this, uh, you know, this, you, you have become an international pariah. You know, you put your, you've always talked about the importance of the existence of the state of Israel. Above all, you put your own existence at risk. You know, if you want to, you know, if you are concerned with security for the long-term survival of Israel, stop what you're doing. Stop it even just for the sake of yourselves. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe, but maybe I, I feel like some, I feel like there has to be some, you know. Um, well, even it, okay, yeah, I'm sure there are. Um, and those are, but they they seem to be, they're definitely a minority. That's the thing. And again, that's what all the opinion polls, <laughs> the, the statements of the political leaders show. Um, yeah. They, they feel like they have no choice. That, that's what, yeah. what it is. You know, we, we well, even it's also, some... they're just right. It's, it's, it, it's a, irrational, you know, again, it's just sort of, it's not a rational assessment would lead to that. a very cold hearted, calculating assessment of the situation would lead them in that direction. And in a way, you can say, like, up until recently, um, it was those kind of people that ran Israel. Yeah, I, I think they were very cruel. They didn't have any concern, you know, for the for the lives or, or, or you know, certainly for the, the welfare of uh, the Palestinians. Uh, but they did have concern for the survival of Israel, and they understood that they had to go slowly. They had to consider international opinion, especially U.S. opinion. And that's why they did things incrementally. You know, they they constantly every every month they took some more Palestinian land, but they didn't take it all at once. Every month, you know, a few Palestinians or a couple dozen would be killed, but they didn't kill hundreds. And uh, you know, just like it was the 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 frog that spoiled slowly. You know, that's mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was people didn't occasionally there were protests from Europe, but it they were kind of just ritualistic, and and the Israelis knew how to handle them as again you know their position was very secure yeah. until recently and it's just that they they have lost you know there there was that um that kind of uh well those people or certainly that mindset it just was blown away by october 7th it kind of just it 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 opened a pandora's box and now you know you just have these um howling demons almost it seems i mean just people openly talking about genocide and reveling in it you know there were there were already there were those voices they existed beforehand but they were not you know they were not the face of israel but now they've become the face of israel it's a bad face to have yeah i, I just it's just yeah i mean israel yeah you said they're bringing about their own destruction and they can't see it you know like if they just accepted like the 1967 borders um and if they just the uh, you know, respected that 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 green line and said, you know, we're not doing any settlements and accept the two state solution where Palestine only gets twenty two percent of its original land. Right. You right. know, it could have that was yeah, right. But they they crossed that green line a long, long time ago, way back in the seventies. Mm. Yeah. 
yeah, there's just something that they, they it just, I guess they just couldn't stop least, this like, idea. I mean, like through the 70s, there was at least this, and maybe through the early 80s, you could you could talk about reversing it. But it's just, it's not, revers it's irreversible now. I mean, they, it's all. Um, um, yeah, okay, just, uh, we're coming clo up close to an hour. I just want to ask you one more thing. Um, yesterday, you, when we were just talking, um, you were saying that there were, there were, that Netanyahu's support of Hamas was actually very open um, yeah. prior to, uh, you know, October 7th and everything. That right. can, can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what, how did yeah. Netanyahu support Hamas? Right. Well, actually, there was a, um, a New York Times story. Again, New York Times, very Zionist news, very, very pro-Israel. Um, but they came out with a, um, um, a story in, in December last year. So just two months after October 7th, detailing how up until just a couple of weeks before October 7th, um, the, uh, the Israelis were um, supporting Hamas, facilitating, facilitating cash transfers. It just, you know, it begins, the article begins with uh, describing how um, Hamas, not Hamas, but rather um, a Mossad agent it accompanies Qatari officials, you know, to a Hamas operative in, in Qatar, I believe, um, you know, carrying a, a suitcase full of cash, you know, and this, probably is, this was cash. just, yeah, probably, US but, tax you know, I think it's cash. actually Qatari cash, but it was something, it was, it was, you know, this was something that the, that uh, um, Israel was overseeing and encouraging, and I think in, in some cases directly funding. Um, and, the, the statements, you know, about support for Hamas on the part of Netanyahu, there's not just one or few, you know, from a, you know, from some, uh, let's say, doubtful sources, but from prime ministers, generals, from Netanyahu himself, from um, saying again and again, oh, yeah, this is what Netanyahu is doing, because his, his policy, this is going way back to like two, uh, uh, 2010, uh, he became president again in 2009 after a stint earlier in the 1990s um, to say that his policy has been all along to divide the Palestinians. Okay, you have Fatah, that's the, um, the Palestinian Authority in West Bank, and then Gaza in the, uh, okay, or rather Hamas in Gaza. You have a divided Palestine. That's good for us. So that's part of the reason. And then second, it's just that in general, it's just a Hamas is, we want them to be the face of, of Palestine because we, you know, we don't think that the West will find them to be, you know, uh, uh, palatable. It, it, them, yeah, palatable, right. It's just because they're, they're Islamists mm -hmm. and, you know, I, you know they, they're easily depicted as a terrorist organization. I think this is, you know, utterly false. You know, they, they're not a terrorist organization. They are a political organization. They have committed terrorist acts, but virtually every government on the planet has, you know, arguably committed terrorist acts, and they haven't been particularly bad in that way. And, you know, they clearly de deliver, they're legitimate government organizations that deliver services to their people, and that's why they won this election, you know, back in 2009. But, yeah, you said, but we want them to view the face of Hamas Smotrich, you know, who's now the finance minister and is in Netanyahu's war, war cabinet in 2015. He said, again, openly about this policy, he said uh, that uh, Hamas is an asset uh, and uh, the Palestinian Authority is a burden. In fact, they, in other words, they preferred Hamas. Well, where did he say this? Okay, well, this is this actually came from. Okay, there's a, a long list of you know again, uh, you know, not minor, but leading government officials, former prime ministers, etc. And Netanyahu himself just talking about openly about what he's doing. His policy is to support Hamas, to you know, to make sure their the, the funds get to him. They you know they had debates in the count cabinet, you know, one you know fairly few years ago, and it was this Netanyahu who made it clear we want to get the funds to Hamas because Hamas is good for us. You know, again, um, this is not a secret. This is this is you know well known in Israeli society, and this was okay. That's know, what I was going to ask. Published in recent Haaretz, but it's not even a secret. You know, it's it's in Europe too. It was back in January of this year, Joseph Borrell, you know the the um, the European. Well, what is his title exactly? I guess he's kind of like the foreign minister for the EU. Um, 
but uh, Joseph Burrell you know, said that, you know, everybody knows that uh, the Israelis, Netanyahu in particular, created and funded Hamas. Now, I think created is stretching it. I mean, they were, it, was, it was an organic development. But from early years, there has been support. It's just that the Israelis have understood that this is, Hamas is good for us. You know, and it, it, they, first of all, they went in to encourage divisions. You know, we don't want to have a single organization representing the Palestinians. But then second, these are Islamists. The Westerners, are, you know, are not going to find them easy to get along with. Mm. And, and it will be easy to paint them as terrorists. Do people bring this up often in Israeli society? I'd be like, hey, you really screwed up. You know, this was yeah, well, <laughs> um, yeah. No, I think it's because, you know, again, this was a very angry um, um, opinion piece that was published in the Haaretz, which is a major, you know, Israeli newspaper. It's kind of like the leading liberal uh, Israeli newspaper. But it, and it was a it, there is a lot of hatred of Netanyahu. And within, you know, before the, October 7th, there was like a huge crisis in Israel, major demonstrations, people, you know, um, just demanding the overthrow of, of the government and the ouster of Netanyahu. Um, and yeah, part of the, the charges that are hurled against him is that, look, you, you created this monster Hamas. It's, that's not a, you know, it's not, I don't think anybody would be shocked in Israel to hear that. That's, that's something that's been thrown around and talked about openly for a long time. Mm, yeah, that's I remember wild. hearing it way, you know, way back, you know, like even 20 years ago. Because it was Netanyahu was president going back in the 1990s. And I think Hamas actually got its start in the 1980s. Okay, well, I guess Netanyahu doesn't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, now he says, <laughs> right, and apparently, like, uh, yeah, the AI has been pro programmed to take the Ned Yahoo position. He says, that's ridiculous, you know, but it's even his oh, own right. statements. I mean, the thing is, like, you have, you know, qu quoting him directly from just like five years ago, just saying, yeah, yeah this is my policy. Isn't it clever? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Dad, well, I think we should end there. We're already over an okay. hour. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, maybe next Appreciate time we it. can talk about the floating pier that's no longer there oh is it gone i heard that it was falling apart <laughs> yeah, from we'll, one we'll storm that's, that's okay. really weird but, uh, yeah okay all right that sounds good okay thanks a lot bye-bye all right we'll talk to you later